so it was starvation in the ghetto. People were hungry, constantly hungry. Prices of food were very high. And it was no occupation, really, from what to make a living. As the ghetto population peaks at 450,000, living conditions become unbearable. The streets are full of starving children, and the diseases of poverty are rampant, first typhus and then tuberculosis. About one third of the ghetto's inhabitants uh, were living in, in subhuman conditions, in cellars and uh, old schools and uh, abandoned cinemas and uh, synagogues and so on. Uh, and uh, there was no food for them, and they were slowly dying. At Treblinka, only 80 kilometers northeast of Warsaw, the gas chambers are designed to kill 6,000 people a day. The camp receives its first victims in early July 1942. Just two weeks later, the Nazis inform the head of the Warsaw Judenrat, Adam Chernyakov, that most of the Jews of the ghetto will be deported to the east at the rate of 6,000 people a day. During the first week of the deportations, Jewish policemen, acting under German orders, evacuate the streets of the ghetto, picking up homeless beggars and children, the destitute, the elderly, the sick and the unemployed. Baruch Spiegel was a youth activist in the Bund. We knew already that uh, the taking them to Treblinka, there are gas chambers and they were gassed. Some people didn't believe it, it's impossible. But there are people in the ghetto who favor armed resistance. The members of the underground youth movements. These include Zionist groups who before the war prepared Jewish teenagers for emigration to Palestine. In March 1942, at a secret conference, one of the Zionist youth leaders, Yitzhak Zuckerman, calls for the immediate formation of a Jewish fighting organization. There were no weapons. We had a pistol that didn't work. One of the fighters tried stabbing a pillow with a knife to see if he could stab a person. We were not used to thinking about killing, about shooting someone with a weapon. The Jewish youth movements order their members to avoid deportation at all costs and to attempt escape from the trains if they are captured. Aharon Karmi is 20 years old when he breaks out of a train carrying him and his family to Treblinka. <laughs> And then my father told us, go and jump off the train. In the end, he said, if one of you will succeed in jumping from the train and remain alive, perhaps you will avenge our deaths. The Jewish resistance fighters announced their presence by setting fire to German-owned businesses in the ghetto. The fighters also distribute leaflets, warning Jews that deportation means death and urging them to resist in any way possible. My function was to go after curfew and paste the, uh, the posters calling uh, the Jews to armed rebellion. Uh, you know, there were patrols, but it was dark and we knew the streets, and we're going through the valley, through the backyards. Uh, 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 you know, risking uh, our lives, but we were young, and uh, one was going with a bucket and the uh, 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 and the brush uh, to paste the wall, and the other one was running with the roll of posters and uh, clipping them. We, we were too young, I think, to realize how dangerous it really was. The uh, order of the day from Hashem Eratzayir was that we are not going to be taken alive. You know, we are not going to be allowed to take on the transport. Uh, there was just a conviction, we are just not going. By the fall of 1942, 
the Warsaw Ghetto is a desolate place, emptied of most of its people. Jewish leaders now believe it is just a matter of time before the Nazis will return to deport the remaining population. All the youth movements, including the Socialist Bund, now commit themselves to armed resistance. By January 1943, the Jewish fighting organization grows to 500 members, with a command staff headed by two Zionist youth leaders, Mordecai Anielewicz and Yitzhak Zuckerman, and with a small cache of 30 handguns. There's also a second resistance group of 200 Zionist youth, the ZZW, or the Jewish Fighting Union. The Jewish Fighting Organization issues a manifesto urging all the Jews of the ghetto to resist any further deportations and to be ready, the manifesto says, to die as human beings. Just this, just the will to fight, just to show them they, they want us so humi humiliate that we are not human beings at all. The Germans decide to make their final assault on the ghetto on the eve of Passover, Monday, April 19, 1943. They mobilize almost 2,000 soldiers and 36 officers. And on the first Seder, on April 19, 1943, we get a note calls from the other side. The Germans are surrounding the ghetto. A platoon of German soldiers came through the Muranoska street into the ghetto and went to the Muranoska square, singing, happy. Now, when they came on the Muranoska street, there were two buildings there with flags. One Jewish flag with the Magen David and one Polish flag. The boys, the Jewish boys knew that every bullet has to kill. Otherwise, they won't come out. So when they stopped singing and standing there on the Muranaska Square, they came under fire. And it was hell for them because so many fell. They threw their guns and they ran away. There are only 700 Jewish fighters, many of them teenagers. They're armed with pistols, grenades, Molotov cocktails, with a few rifles and one machine gun. We knew we had to stand up to the regular German army, which had conquered almost all of Europe. We knew that we could not engage in a conflict on a similar scale. We had two aims, vengeance and the redemption of the honor of the Jewish people that we would not go like sheep to the slaughter, that there would be resistance. At 6 a.m., German units, still under the command of Colonel von Samern, place artillery around the ghetto and enter the gates supported by a few armored vehicles. They find only deserted streets. Jewish resistance fighters are hiding high above them, watching from the windows of abandoned apartments. At the corner of Mila and Zamenhofa, they wait until the Germans are right below and then let loose with a barrage of homemade grenades, gasoline bombs and pistol fire. That's unbelievable. I don't believe it. That's, that's, that's our young boys, young men without military background, without education in, in, in tactics. Don't forget, you ask me what they, what they did tactics, nothing. Not one of the leaders had a military background. On the second day of the uprising, the major fighting does not begin until two o'clock in the afternoon. When the Germans enter a small square, the Jewish defenders detonate a mine hidden under the intersection, which kills and injures a large number of German soldiers. Aharon Karmi remembers that day, the day of Hitler's birthday, as a joyous one for the Jewish resistance. As the then, moment as a, in that moment, when I shot at the Germans and saw them falling, then I said, this is the revenge that my father wanted. This is the moment. By the fourth day, 
the Germans begin to burn down the ghetto, block by block. The whole city was in flame, because the whole city was burning. So many blocks, not one, so many blocks, most of them took their children to the to the carousel, which was with music, which was around that. You could see with the naked eye what was going on in the ghetto, the flames and the burning, everything. And you were just listening to the expressions, Jews are burning. I was in that environment of the people. Until today, I cannot understand where did I take the strength not to scream, not to reveal who I am, that I look at my people burning, and I cannot say anything. And here the carousel is, dry, is running. The people are on the carousel with the parents happy. I will never forget the picture. We went out into the ghetto at night and we passed through raging flames. I don't know how we passed through, how we did it. I have no idea. I can only tell you that the asphalt was melting under our feet. Window panes were exploding. Everything was flowing like water. It was hell on earth. The situation at Mila 18 becomes desperate. Nearly all the food is gone, the air is bad, heat unbearable, and the fighters have almost no ammunition left. Resistance commander Mordecai Anielewicz orders 20 more fighters to try to escape from the ghetto. Many of them do not want to leave their comrades, even if it means death. I told him I'm not leaving. He said to me, no, you are going. There are 10 others in the group and you are going with them. You will go to Yitzhak Zuckerman and tell him what is happening here, that he should send help quickly so we could get out to the forest or somewhere else. Maybe he can send weapons. That's what I had to tell him. The situation is very bad and we need help. But help never comes. On May 7th, the Germans discover the location of the bunker at number 18 Mila Street. The next morning at 10 a.m., they return. It takes two hours to break into the bunker. The fighting is fierce, and the Germans use poison gas to try to drive the fighters out. Most of the 120 Jewish resistance fighters, including their commander, Mordecai Anilevich, decide it is better to die at their own hands than become prisoners of the Nazis. With their remaining bullets, one by one, they shoot themselves. At the very last moment as the Germans break in, 15 fighters find a previously undiscovered passageway leading outside and get away undetected. But most of the fighters perish. The final testament of Mordecai Anilevich is a letter sent earlier in the uprising to his deputy, Yitzhak Zuckerman. Anilevich wrote, Peace go with you, my friend. Perhaps we shall meet again. The main thing is the dream of my life has come true. Self-defense in the ghetto and Jewish armed resistance have become a reality. I have lived to see the magnificent heroism of Jewish fighters in battle. But the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was just part of the fabric of Jewish resistance. We know today of 63 places where there were resistance groups. We know of roughly 20,000 Jews who fought in the forest. So this is not an isolated case, you see. Wherever they had the opportunity, and in some places where they didn't have the opportunity, they fought.
To live with honor and die with honor It was their message to us all They gave their lives for our freedom Through pain and agony Fought for humanity We'll keep their memory Welcome, this is Professor Gayer, and today's lecture is going to be on resistance during the Holocaust, and I'm reporting to you from location in the Warsaw Ghetto. You'll see some of the fighting going on behind me. The escape from Sobibor concentration camp, the uprising at Auschwitz's crematorium, and we'll also look at the partisans in the woods with the Belsky brothers. So let me first get started by talking about resistance in general. Resistance did not have to be only physical. There were other forms of resistance, of course, that we know. There was spiritual resistance, uh, anything that uh, the Jews did that the Nazis said they weren't allowed to do was of course um, resistance such as having religious services in the ghetto or um, uh, even teaching the children their Hebrew lessons. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was uh, the most famous one of all. We do hear about that more than anyone else. Uh, this, that's, the most has been written about that um, and for a good reason. The uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising uh, lasted quite a while. The young people in the ghetto were getting anxious. They wanted to uh, rise up against the Nazis. And this was in 1943. And when they went to the uh, Judenrat, uh, Adam Cherniakov, the head of the Judenrat, the Jewish council, uh, in a very, um, what was then typical uh, style of uh, that generation of elderly uh, Jewish men. He said, no, he says, uh, you'll just make things worse for the Jews by fighting and resisting. Uh, Jews aren't fighters, we're people of the book, and, and, and so, so on. And so uh, they would not co cooperate. The Jewish council would not cooperate in giving them arms. Well, Shani Yaakov eventually took his life when he was given the order by Commissar Auerswald to start deporting 6,000 deportees a day from the uh, ghetto. Now you have to understand the ghetto was extremely crowded. At one point there were about 480,000 people crammed into a three square mile area in the ghetto with no sanitary uh, facilities and uh, no running water, uh, typhus running rampant, starvation was at the rate of 4,500 people dying a month of starvation and it was not unusual to walk down the street and every hundred meters or so uh, have to step over or around a corpse. Uh, so the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising uh, really took shape after he passed away, when he, he committed suicide I should say, because he wasn't going to uh, allow the Nazis to uh, uh, have him deport the 6,000 a day which included men, women and children and he felt that he could not have that on his conscience. And so he um, he does commit suicide. And at that point, the Jewish fighting organization, known as the ZOB, under the command of uh, Mordechai Anyelevich and second in command Yitzhak Zuckerman, uh, steps in. And they 
unify the rest of the youth groups all under the one uh, 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 banner, let's say, of the Jewish fighting organization. And throughout the ghetto there are several hundred, maybe six, seven hundred young people who are uh, fighters. Um, there are thousands of more people, but these are older people who are not ready to fight, able to fight, know how to use arms. And in fact, the younger people did not know how to use arms either. As uh, you'll see, they had to uh, train themselves and practice, and even the women were trained as sharpshooters and so forth. Well, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising resulted from the Nazis coming in during January of 1943, and they were attempting to liquidate the ghetto, and they were not prepared for the kind of resistance that they met. Uh, they were uh, attacked from rooftops and from uh, bunkers and from uh, empty apartments. Uh, they were ambushed as they entered the ghetto. And the Jewish uh, fighting organization had been accumulating arms for months at that point. Um, smuggling in arms, getting them on the black market, uh, which was very difficult because the Polish army would not help them either. And uh, at that point the Nazis uh, retreated because they really weren't prepared for that kind of resistance. And uh, the commander was replaced um, because he did not uh, clear the ghetto out. And somebody new was sent in eventually. His name was Zurgan Strup, who eventually was the commander of the Nazis, who does clear the ghetto in the end. And they wait till April to re-enter the ghetto. And in the meantime, between January and April, that buys the Jewish fighting organization time to uh, smuggle in uh, arms, to build uh, some Molotov cocktails with um, uh, chemicals and dynamite that's smuggled over the wall, and also to ambush Nazis that do uh, cluster around in places in the ghetto. And uh, when they ambush them, they would uh, murder them and take their arms, their guns, their bullets, and so forth. And so they were training themselves in a bunker at a place called uh, Mila 18, uh, M-I-L-A, it's Mila 18, and that's the, just simply the address of the headquarters of the Jewish Fighting Organization. And it was there that uh, orders came forth from Mordechai and Yelevich, Yitzhak Zuckerman, and some of the other uh, very uh, notable characters that uh, were in that uh, group were Marek Edelman, uh, a woman by the name of Zvea Luperikin, who eventually does marry Yitzhak Zuckerman and goes to uh, uh, Israel and starts the Ghetto Fighters House, the first Holocaust museum in the world, uh, up in the Galilee um, uh, area of Israel. And so the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, when the Nazis come back in, in April of 1943, which was Passover night, by the way, very typical of the Nazis, uh, they they didn't know that so much arms had been accumulated and so much firepower had been built up and uh, in addition to that in the plaza where the Nazis would enter the ghetto uh, over the months the Jewish fighting organization had built a minefield so at the right time they were able to detonate this minefield and blow many of the Nazis up blow up their uh, tanks um, and uh, set them on fire with Molotov cocktails and bombs, uh, homemade bombs and so forth. And so uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising lasts approximately 28 days. In fact, it takes the Nazis longer to take the Warsaw Ghetto than it does for Germany, the Nazis, to take all of Poland uh, when they initially invade Poland in September of 1939. Uh, because the Jewish fighting organization at that point realizes that they're going to die one way or another. They already have the news that they're going to be sent to Treblinka in the deportation. Treblinka they know now, they have a, a map that's smuggled back because one of the uh, uh, fighters, Zygmunt, uh, follows the uh, train and comes back and tells them definitively what Treblinka is. And it is a death camp. They're not even building barracks in Treblinka because the people are coming off the train, totally taking a shower and immediately gassed and put into the ovens, men, women, and children, by the thousands. By the thousands. And so, um, eventually Treblinka is uh, uh, responsible for the murder of about 900,000 people. 330,000 of them come directly from the Warsaw Ghetto itself. And so the ghetto uprising becomes quite uh, uh, a motivator for other ghettos when word gets out to start to um, uh, resist the Nazis physically. 
because the young people started to feel that if they're going to die, they might as well die with what they called honor, Jewish honor. And in fact, Mordechai Yanyelevich takes his own life towards the end when he realizes, of course, that the Nazis are now burning the, the ghetto down, building by building, leveling them by blowing them up and burning them down, and sealing off the, uh, the um, sewers, which had been serving as bunkers for the Jewish fighting organization, sealing off the sewer caps and pumping in either water to drown them or gas to gas them underground alive. And so, at that point, uh, Anulevich writes a letter saying that he knows he's going to be taken, uh, but he has witnessed, he has been witness to the proudest moment of his life, and that is he has been witness to Jewish resistance in the ghetto in all its glory and that's what his wish his dying wish is and he uh, he witnesses it but he does take his life uh, before being taken towards the very end I expect you to be smiling other people that were in that group did uh, survive uh, Simcha Rodin who's name was if a problem like yesterday, he also survived. Sorry, you but I can't, I can't retape this whole thing just because somebody's calling on my phone, so just ignore that. Thank you. Um, this is part of life, I guess. Um, I should have taken my phone off the hook, but then my wife would have gotten upset. I want to move on to uh, resistance in the camps to talk about one particular camp, uh, actually two camps together, and uh, one is called Sobibor. And what about Sobibor and um, and uh, Auschwitz? I want to talk about the two of them together, but first I want to talk for a number of minutes about Sobibor. Uh, Sobibor was a camp that was not open that long because after the uprising there, the escape, the Nazis did shut it down, uh, level the ground and plant grass suit over it with the hope that they would be, uh, oh, they didn't remove any traces of that camp ever being there. Uh, but I, I, a lot of Jews died in Sobibor. It was one of the action, Reinhardt, uh, Operation Reinhardt, uh, six death camps. There were six camps that were built as death camps, and Sobibor was one of them. And so, uh, several hundred prisoners plan an escape from Sobibor. Uh, Sobibor had a lot of workshops in the camp. Uh, leather making workshops, boot making workshops, and the Jews were made to work, of course, in these workshops to make uh, things for the Germans, uh, boots for them, and leather jackets, and so forth. Uh, and so, the plan was made with uh, a man by the name of Alexander Pachersky, who was a Russian commander, because there were also Russians in that camp, and uh, Leo Femhelder, uh, who was one of the Jewish leaders. And uh, they decided that they were going to try and We've got uh, to stay have together. A escape, a mass escape. And not just one or two people. But a mass escape. Now, minor escapes had been tried. At one time, uh, I think it was maybe about uh, 13 uh, men did attempt to escape from Soviet War. They were caught and brought back. A typical Nazi style, uh, to make an example of them, they were told that they were going to be, of course, murdered in front of all the other inmates of the camp. But that each one of those who had escaped and, be re and was caught and recaptured had to pick someone else to die with them so that twice as many people, 26 people, would have to be uh, murdered. And in, 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 in that case, what happened uh, was that uh, they told them that if you don't, each don't pick somebody else, then we're going to kill 50 Just others. Leave back. And so typical Nazi collective uh, mass uh, retaliation, uh, that was one of the uprisings. But that didn't stop them from uh, planning a, a larger uprising of everybody. And so when the time came, the right time came, 
uh, for this plan. If you want to they had accumulated to uh, and made enough makeshift weapons and so on. Uh, they planned it at a time when uh, there was going to be a roll call and a lot of the Nazis, as they came in to pick up some of their items that were being made in some of the shops, were ambushed and, and murdered by some of the uh, Jewish people, uh, men who had never held a gun or a knife. Who, this was totally alien to them. Uh, but they had to do it. They, they knew it was a life and death situation at this point. And so, the... Um, Escape is planned, and uh, lately, recently, they f they finding excavation is finding uh, that they believe there was also a tunnel that was built, and they're finding uh, the remains of some uh, people down in the tunnel at Sobibor. Uh, it seems that they were also uh, tunneling out from the center of one of the uh, cabins, apparently uh, under the ground, under the floor. There, they were tunneling out, and they had uh, created quite an escape tunnel. Uh, which was never finished, but it does, does show you that they were determined to fight and, and escape. And so at the, uh, at the escape of, from Sobibor, when they do attempt to escape, they break down the barbed wire fence. Uh, a lot of people get uh, caught on the fence in trying to escape. The Nazis do shoot at them as they are all running out of the camp. Several hundred escapees. They make it to the woods. They do. M many die in the, in the attempt. Uh, because they're also concerned with the fact that outside the barbed wire fence is a minefield between the, f between the fence and the woods that they were trying to escape to was a minefield, which indeed was active and did in fact blow up a number of the escapees. But a number of them did make it to the woods. Many of them, a good number of them, were recaptured, but some of them did go on to uh, uh, escape fully. People like Esther Turner Robb, who uh, was a witness at some of the Nazi uh, trials later in later years. Alexander Pachersky, he uh, still alive in, uh, uh, he was alive for many, many years after that. He just passed away, I think, a number of years ago uh, in Russia. And so, the, um, uh, there was a, a, a good number that did survive and testified as to the horrors that took place in Sobibor. Uh, and so, what we're looking at here is, uh, a, 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 I guess you would call it a successful escape, partially successful. But it wasn't the only attempt at an escape from a camp. Uh, of course, Sobibor it was the most famous one, and uh, and you'll be seeing here clips of the uh, movie that was made about it. It's, and, and I do highly recommend the movie. It's very well done, Escape from Sobibor. It was made, I believe, in the uh, uh, late 1980s. Uh, but whatever it was made, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's it's pretty well done as far as telling this story. At the end, they do show the names of some of the people and where they wound up later on, um, such as this woman Esther, who uh, you, as my students, have read about in our Images Literature book about Esther um, escaping to the woods. And as I've told in class, uh, I have met Esther um, because she uh, used to tell her, give her testimony uh, in Cherry Hill, and I used to bring my children, when I taught elementary school and middle school, I used to bring my children to hear her tell her story at the local Jewish community center. And so uh, Esther Turner Robb, uh, who lives in New Jersey, she's passed away since then, uh, was one of the uh, victims that they show up on the screen, uh, what happened to her, and it says that she did eventually escape, and, and uh, she now lives in New Jersey. Uh, and, uh, and a number of the others are on that screen. Now another camp uprising that takes place is one that takes place in Auschwitz at one of the crematoriums. Now, and there's a movie that you'll see playing in the background uh, that shows you some of the key scenes from that. The movie was called The Gray Zone. Well, Daniel Benzali, and it is an absolutely excellent, excellent portrayal 
of this particular event. Let me give you the background of the one where they tried to escape by blowing up the crematorium. It was planned and executed by the Sonder Commandos. Now one needs to understand the role of the Sonder Commandos in the death camps. The Sonder Commandos, as you may have already learned in class, and if you haven't then you will now, the Sonder Commandos were the uh, Jews that were chosen at the, at, at the, on the selection line when they were um, uh, processed into Auschwitz or the other death camps. They were chosen to work in the crematorium and the gas chambers and their function was to first of all not tell the people the truth about what was about to happen and tell them to just put their clothing on, their, on the hooks and tie their shoelaces together so both shoes would stay together and so on and that they would retrieve them all after their shower and uh, they had been shaved at that point and, and, and so part of their job was to deceive the incoming Jews and then the other part of their job was what's after the few hundred people would be gassed each time, they would have to clear out the gas chamber, the doors would be opened, the gas would be uh, taken out with a large exhaust fan, and then they would have to enter and, and, and pry the bodies apart because many of the people were crawling over other bodies trying to gasp and, and, and find a pocket of air as they were gassed. And so the Sonder Commando's job was to separate the bodies and then take them to possibly the uh, dissection room or table where if there was gold in their teeth that had to be extracted, the teeth had to be pulled out with some kind of wrench because the Nazis saw every part of the human body as a potential product from which they could produce something and make money, even though it was a human body part. As we know, the hair was used to put into bales and sent to cloth manufacturers to make pillows, blankets, and other fabrics. And now we also know that the gold was used because the gold was valuable in those days, and it's still valuable today, gold to take it from the uh, fillings. They had gold fillings in their teeth. And so every part of the human body was harvested, uh, I guess you could say, for potential profit. That uprising occurred because they managed to smuggle gunpowder into the crematoriums and they knew where the gunpowder was stored in Auschwitz in Birkenau and he managed to get it smuggled in by a variety of methods. One of the methods was that the women helped smuggle in the uh, gunpowder by putting the powder into the hem of their concentration camp dresses. And then when the Nazis weren't looking at a certain key point, they would shake the gunpowder out of their hem uh, into a pile where the men would then get it. Very often they made little packets of gunpowder, little cloth satchel, little pa 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 packets, I guess, like a little satchel, which they hid in the armpits and the private areas of the corpses as they were taken from the uh, gas chamber to the crematorium. That's, and then the men in the crematorium knew where to look in the bodies to find the little packets of gunpowder. So, what we're talking about is again resistance. Resistance because 
they knew that their fate was eventual death. The Sonder Commandos knew that their time was limited. The average lifespan of a Sonder Commando, once they were appointed to that particular job, was about three months. The Nazis felt that they had seen too much. They had seen the inner workings of the final solution to the Jewish question. And so because of this knowledge, this eyewitness knowledge, the Nazis didn't want them to become a possible future liability. And so every three months the Sonder Commandos were murdered themselves and then a new batch was chosen from what they felt were strong, healthy, incoming individuals. It was basically the men who were chosen for that job. Doctors were also chosen to perform experiments using uh, their medical knowledge for evil. Uh, they were forced into that, but there were a lot of Nazi doctors who also used their medical knowledge um, Aside from Jewish doctors who were made to assist, the Nazi doctors performed uh, very, very uh, bizarre experiments on the human beings that uh, we'll c I cover in another lecture on Nazi medicine. And so, the, the, the movie, The Gray Zone, as I said before, is a very, very uh, intense movie. Uh, I would suggest a couple of things. It's a very dark movie, and when I say dark, I don't necessarily mean emotionally, although it is emotionally a very dark story, uh, if, if you understand that symbolically. But it's also because of the, the, the setting and where it's supposed to be shot in the crematorium, which was pretty dark in there, I would recommend if you watch this movie, watch it in a dark room with very few lights on because some of the scenes will be very difficult to see what's going on and the details and so on if there's any light in the room that will sh hit upon the screen and wash it out. Uh, it's just a, a suggestion. Uh, it's a very touching movie. It shows, it depicts a young girl of about 13 or 14 the uh, Sonder Commandos are about to put her body into the crematoriums and they notice that she's still breathing. And what are they going to do? It creates a dilemma. If, well, first of all, morally, how can you put one of your fellow human beings, well, the Nazis did it, but they couldn't put a fellow Jew into the oven, a young girl who was still breathing, she had managed to find an air pocket on the ground, some a puddle of, of water, moisture, where she apparently was able to survive the gas chamber. So do you put her into the oven alive, still breathing? But the dilemma that they, cho that they faced was their choice. The alternative was to keep her, but secretly, hide her, which would not be too easy. And if sh if they were caught, they would all be killed. There would be collective punishment. Which really didn't matter at that point, because the Sonder Commandos knew that one way or another they were going to meet their death. Whether it be at the end of the three months, or sooner if they got caught with this young girl. So the attempt is made to save her. And of course, Dr. Miklos Nisli, who is a doctor that is forced to help Mengele perform experiments in the camp, he's called in to try and revive her. It becomes a situation where they have to make some very, very um, tough decisions, let's say. And they have to make those decisions uh, 
fairly quickly because the girl does eventually get discovered. Eventually they do have the uprising and the crematorium. Nobody really escapes from that particular event. But there is mass punishment once the rebellion is put down and that crematorium is then shut down and it's one less crematorium that's operating full time. The last segment I want to talk about was resistance coming from the woods, from the surrounding woods, uh, not in the camps, not in the ghettos, but in the woods across Poland, the woods especially across the Soviet Union, Lithuania, uh, those whole, the Ukraine as we call it today, there were a lot of partisans. The partisans were young, mili young people who took to the woods in like their own paramilitary groups to fight the Nazis in the woods, sabotage their supply lines, uh, ambush their trains, blow up train tracks to prevent uh, supplies as well as Jews being, being sh shipped to the camps. And uh, they would uh, ambush Nazi battal battalions at any uh, possible chance. And so that particular group, the partisans, they were they, they formed groups which were known as Otriads, O-T-R-I-A-D-S. And Otriad was a paramilitary group. And the most famous one of all is the Belsky brothers, B-I-E-L-S-K-I. And the movie that tells their story so beautifully is Defiance. The Belsky brothers did not really ask for recognition. In fact, for many, many years, their story remained untold until Tuvia Belsky, one of the older brothers, he died. They were living in Brooklyn. He and his brother Zeus were owning a owned a trucking company for 30 years after the war in Brooklyn and didn't really ask for anything of recognition. Of course, as their granddaughter told it, there were always, always people in and out of Grandpa's, Grandpa's house, his apartment, and they always used to say, you don't know, but you're, you're lucky, this is your, you're lucky to have this man as a grandpa. This man saved my life. And she never did understand in her early days how her grandfather saved so many lives. Well, the Belsky brothers were from a little village called Novogrodnik. And when the Nazis, their roving killing squads, the Einsatzgruppen, is in the Ukraine near Kiev, uh, a ravine called Babiar, which means Grandmother Ravine. And there, in a one weekend period, 33,771 Jews were murdered, brought out there in truckloads in, into the woods and undressed and then just mowed down uh, like you would mow grass down except with machine guns. And Defiance is the movie that tells the story of the Belsky brothers, the most famous of these Otriads. Uh, they decided, they really knew the woods well, and so they decided they were going to fight the Nazis by staying in the woods. After their parents had been killed, they took to the woods. And they started rescuing Jews from other villages, towns, and ghettos, and bringing them out, and other people heard about them, and when they were able to escape the ghetto, they went to the woods. And what the Belsky brothers did was they started bringing people, taking people in and, 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 and sheltering them. And eventually they formed a community of sorts. They, 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 they had their own shops, they, they built their own little um, lean-tos, little huts to live, to, to make it through the winter. Um, they utilized the labor and skills of everybody who they rescued for the betterment of the entire uh, uh, group. So if somebody was a nurse, then she was given the task of medical care in the makeshift community that they built. They, they 
taught the children in makeshift schools in the woods, and they lasted for about two or three years. At one point, the Belsky Brothers Eurotriad had about 1,200 people in it. Now, you do the math. 1,200 people who survived because of these brothers. And if each of those 1,200 people went on to survive and marry someone, and they had just two children, you start to realize the magnitude of what these rescue missions created. Just like Oscar Schindler. He saved 1,100 people. Well, you do the same similar math and you start realizing the thousands of people that are alive today. Because of this one man, or because of these two brothers, and the Belsky brothers' story was never really told until Tuvia Belsky died and his obituary was in the news and there was a little blurb about what he and Zeus and Aaron, their youngest brother, uh, what they had done. And at the time there was a professor and Holocaust researcher at Brooklyn College, or Brooklyn, yeah, Brooklyn College, her name was Nahama Tech. Nahama Tech picked up on the story and began to do some very extensive research and eventually wrote the book Defiance, the story of the Belsky brothers. And then their story became worldwide knowledge. And in fact, the book is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And of course, from that book, they created this movie with Daniel Craig in it uh, called Defiance. And I have to tell you, it's a very, very well done movie. Yes, they do take some license uh, as far as trying to be more creative. You know, that's Hollywood. When Hollywood decides to take the Holocaust and put it on the big screen, um, as much as we don't like it, they sometimes alter the story a bit to uh, fit their Hollywood parameters, I guess we'll call them. So there is a scene at the very end where they um, they get across the swamp and they come up to a hill and then on the top of that hill they meet up with some Nazis and they have a royal battle of 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 machine guns and so on. There's a, a an extremely violent battle that takes place towards the end of the movie. That never took place. That was something that the filmmaker put in for whatever creative reason they put it in. So, but with that I, I do say that the movie was an excellent portrayal of a very, very important event. It's a, it's, it's one of my favorite movies, along with The Gray Zone. They're very powerful movies in the way that they tell the story and tell it so well. It's, it's, it's such a challenge to bring the stories of the Holocaust to life on this big screen. You have to be true to the memory of the person that you're depicting, portraying. You have to be sincerely true to the story itself. Keep the facts as close to the reality that occurred as possible. And you have to make sure you don't romanticize such a movie uh, because rescuers do not see themselves as heroes. Hollywood has a tendency to make glamorize people into a hero, make Oscar Schindler into a, a hero, make the Beltsky brothers into a hero for what they did. And what they did was very noble. But if you were to ask them as they were asked, and if you were to ask other rescuers who have been asked, they will tell you, 
I'm not a hero. I was not a hero. I just did what was the natural thing to do when you see somebody in danger. And that's the way these, because that's the way these people were brought up. It was not a major decision for them. Should I help save these people? They didn't really have to think it through, think about it, think about the consequences. And the consequences were great. If you got caught assisting a Jew, it could be death to you and your whole family. So that would make you think, well, that's going to make somebody really give second thoughts to what they're doing. And no doubt there are a lot of people who did have second thoughts out there that who, who, who thought about it and never did help. But the ones who did help will tell you there was no decision for them to make. They just did what came natural to them. So we, we got a little bit off resistance here and into a topic which we'll be covering later on, of course, which was rescue. Rescuing um, uh, 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 by righteous Gentiles, as they're called in Yad Vashem. So I'm, I'm going to bring this lecture to a close now with uh, just a few more comments. Resistance during the Holocaust. Let's just wrap it up with a few basic ideas that you need to take away from this lecture. Resistance takes many forms. One, it does not have to be only physical. It can be spiritual. It can be emotional. There are all ways to resist. They do not have to be physical and violent. Martin Luther King showed us that. We did not have to be violent to get our point across and resist a law that was unjust. Unfortunately, there was some violence during the Civil Rights Movement. But that's not what King preached. He preached non-violent resistance, which is the same principle that Gandhi preached in India. But I do have to end here by telling you that there are those times when you do have to resist physically not just spiritually, as many people did during the Holocaust by defying the Nazis' orders. But there does come a point when one's confronted with so much evil, especially in the case of genocide, that one has to decide physical resistance is appropriate here as well.